again with Jim Thompson in episode 214 of the BTS Creative Academy podcast, Uncut, with me, your host, Martin Colton. Because you're a spy or something like that, aren't you? I am a Russian spy. <laughs> a Russian? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. That's some new information for you. So, uh, Jim. And where are we starting? <laughs> of course we've started. You know how this works. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. So, and, um, uh, but, um, but, welcome to welcome a slightly to different surroundings. Theatre 2 at the Harlow Playhouse. Um, this is, yeah, this is surreal being in this space this morning, actually, because this is, for me, this is where it all began. This is... Ah, but it's, it's was started, it Romeo and Juliet, was it? Or Romeo what? and Juliet on, in here uh, when I was 16 in this room playing Romeo. Wow. Um, before that, I'd done a show on the main stage. So I could guess you could kind of say it started on the main stage. But with that show, that was, I felt like I was kind of just part of a club. And I was just yeah, doing- Yeah, was it? Youth, it was just a youth um, theater, a youth theater club. Whereas was it, when was I- Was it play, Playhouse Young People's Theater or something like that, wasn't it? The Young People's the Playhouse Theatre, the, YHPT or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the People's Republic of, <laughs> of, of Theatre. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I did the, I did the, the main stage one, but, but at that time, yeah, I just felt like I was doing another, you know when you're young, you go to these clubs, youth groups and things. Yeah. For me, that was just being part of another club. Yeah. Whereas when I came up here and did the shows up here, something felt different. It, it, it turned into... Oh, this is what I do now. This is this is who I am now. Yeah. Once I came in, so, think, so this room to me feels like my first home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this theatre feels like my kind of first home when I first moved to Harlow, mm. which was in '97. So, twenty-seven years ago. Uh, this. Oh my God, what's the date? Uh, we're in June. June eighteenth. Okay, 22nd of June, 97 was when I moved to Harlow. Wow. So we're almost 27 years to the day. Wow, there's, there's some coincidences with dates coming up that I've been thinking about this oh, morning. Okay. But before we get into to that, okay. you know what we, we haven't done. Oh. Yeah, because well, this was the thing when I first, <laughs> no, exactly. first did it. Okay, right. so, so uh, we're going to go 3, 2, 1, Claire. Okay. 3, 2, 1. That was good. And we're in. That that yeah, was that's it. That's proper in. That now now we're proper in. So um so I'm getting you back. <laughs> you get me back for what? <laughs> what I, do? I, keep, I keep trying to figure that out. Like, every time I do something, I'm like, well, I'm getting you back. Getting yeah, back for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so episode one, you were here at the start, which I think at the start, I, I think we just yes. called it start episode oh, one. It was yeah, and it's interesting looking it back because I was like, we were sat there mm. in a theatre. Can I just say, at least this is fairly warm, unlike yes. the Vicky Hall, which can be fucking freezing. Yes. But not on that, that was in, so, so yeah, so this is where the dates kind of connect. So my idea with you is, I think when we did that first one, yeah, we sat down and I said to you afterwards, or during, at some point I said to you, it'll come back at number 50. And oh then, no! See, I'll hear, I thought you said fifteen. Oh, fifteen! Yeah. No, I, I thought oh, he's, he's only gone. He's only got like another thirteen people to talk to, and then he's going to have to talk to me Come again. Back. Or maybe I did. Maybe I did say fifteen. Then. Yeah. But then I had it in my head, no, fifty, and then we started to surpass that, and then it was like right, hundred. You just were like a boulder rolling down a hill. You were just gaining more and more momentum as it, it as it all that. went on. Yeah, it has been that. And so what's interesting with this is, whilst today's date isn't a year anniversary of when we recorded that episode, right? this will go out on that anniversary date. Woo! <laughs> because I have a schedule where I'm putting content out every single day, mm. and I've got such a backlog of these. So is this like a retrospective of the year that you've had? Is that the only reason I'm here? No, the reason that you're here is because you said to me, 
can we do it properly? Then? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it isn't a the rec- first one. Yeah, the first one was a bit like just random me and you chatting in the pub sort of thing. Yes. Whereas, Slightly. It, whereas there is kind of a format to these now. Yeah. Which I think you being a listener. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm probably one of the, the few listeners because mm. that I don't really. <laughs> no, you're the listener. Jim. I'm the listener. <laughs> yeah, you're the listener. I do this for you. <laughs> Oh, Christ, OK. Yes. I bet show more appreciation <laughs> for it then. Um, <laughs> no, because I, 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 I've literally just been to the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why I'm pointing that way, because I've just moved my gym. I think the, the, rest the gym is over that way. Oh, the way. gym is that way, yeah. It is. It, it, yeah. And um, I've just been listening to the first bit of the Ian Greenwood, uh, Dead by Day, Day by Night episode. A mutual friend. A mutual friend. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, that is... For me, the gym um, uh, is the the time where I'm kind of like, I've got no other distractions. I've got me routine. And I know that there's probably a lot of people out there that think, no, you should always change up your routine, but I'm a creature of habit. Mm-hmm. And um, a part of that routine is listening to the podcast because you can get a good hour and a half in there. And, you know, that can sometimes barely cover 10% of some of your podcasts lately. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but especially sort of like the because I've been listening to the Romford Film Festival ones because mm-hmm. they're much shorter. I've actually been able to get two in a gym session, which has been quite nice. Right. Um, well, I do yeah. appreciate you listening. Yeah, to gym. I do. I do. But as a result, I don't watch anything on YouTube. No, because it's too much of a distraction. Yeah, I'm kind of doing other things now. It's yeah. It. It doesn't fit in with my sort of routine. Well, it's exactly the same content whether you're whether you're listening on whether you're yeah. listening on Apple or Spotify or yeah. whether you're watching on YouTube. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. It's just you get the visual of two people sitting there having a chat, and you get to see what these what these what ugly mugs look like. What these idiots, yeah. <laughs> what these what these people look. There like. was one person who I I was. Sort of I, sorry, I, I just to. need to clarify yeah, yeah, yeah. something. I've learned this along oh, yeah. the way to clarify things. When I say ugly mugs, I'm referring to me and you, not the other guests. Oh <laughs> yes, that have been on the yes. podcast. I'm just right now. I'm referring to me and you. The other guests have all been beautiful and nice to or look at. Or handsome. Or handsome. They've been yeah. really nice to look at. Yeah. Apart, should, should... apart from Ian Greenwood. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It, Ian's different. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to listen but, to that one to the end. All right. Okay. Yeah, uh, no yeah. doubt he's probably hurling abuse at some point <laughs> at, in my di- direction, <laughs> which no, is fine I, because I, 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 I hurl abuse back at him. So, mm. yes. Give and take. Give and take. Mm. Yeah. So yes, all right. So yeah, let's, are we doing this properly then? I guess so. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a hundred percent convinced. I know. It's just so I've got is. you know. I've got the. How are we for on, time? On the meter. You on the meter. I'm right? On the meter. Yeah. Right. Okay. So no. So let's let's do this properly now. So yeah, there is over this past year there is a, a format. We start off with a little bit of banter that we were just doing Tick. there. Tick. Tick. Um, and then the next stage is to go. So where did this all begin, Jim? This all began. Um, theatrically, it all began when I was eight, and the there was a a theatre company going around all the schools in Gateshead, Newcastle, looking for children to be part of the junior chorus for Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat, and they were going around all the different schools and auditioning kids. And I'd done a little bit of like school plays and stuff like that, and at home. I used to do little performances for my family. Did you? And I used to drag my brother. I'd write little scripts Mm -hmm. and I'd force my brother to perform these little shows that I would do for my mum or uh, for my grandparents. And um, yeah, that was that was sort of how it began. So you so from a really young age, there was a performer. In you, yeah, just, just, just the, just the joy of play mm-hmm. um, was there. Um, but then it's weird because I don't remember the rehearsal process of Joseph. Okay. I only remember the performances. Mm-hmm. I remember being in the dressing room with the light bulbs that burnt your skin if you touched them. <laughs> 
which was a very and so early how early. old were you at so this? So eight. You was eight years old eight in years the old. first first production. And so why did you go to this first production? Why did you? Why was you there? And because it, was it because you did those family shows? Because you did them things at home, your mum, your dad, they knew yeah. to push you into that. Or? I'd, um, I was in my, I can't remember the, whether it was a nursery school or, because it was a slightly different school and structure to what it is down here. But I was Joseph two years running in the nativity in my okay. primary school, which was unheard of apparently. <laughs> but because I was, I, I just seemed to have a natural affinity to remembering what I had to do and delivering the lines I had to do, deliver. And I think because of that, I was sort of given opportunities in sort of like school plays, although at that age, they weren't really plays, they were just sort of like little performances. Mm -hmm. And th I think through that, they kind of was like, oh, well, we've got some kids that we think would be good, and I was one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, I think that's how we ended up doing this. Um, and so it was a theatre company that was raising money for charity. So Lloyd Webber apparently did not, was not allowing people to do his Joseph and his Technicolor Dream Code because it was apparently it was on in the West End or something. But Quite these, a big show. It was a massive <laughs> show, yeah. Um, and this company were given special dispensation because all of the profits were going to an African charity. Mm. Um, and it was at the Gulbenkian Theatre in Newcastle, which is a similar sort of space to this, attached to the main play, Newcastle Playhouse main stage. Okay. So it shared a green room. There was loads of sort of like fairly big similarities with how it's set up here, mm -hmm. except the scope of it was a little bit bigger. Um, and... I yeah it, that that show was the roar of like the audience applause and things like that and the lights and how you, you, the 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 stage lights were so blindingly bright and you you couldn't really see the audience but you could you could hear them you could feel mm. the energy coming off them and being surrounded by these adults who were just to an 8 year old absolute megastars just blew me away um and that was it from that point on i was properly hooked tell me more about being eight years old and on the stage what what was what was that what is that memory you have of being there under the spotlight how did that how did that feel uh that that was you were i see you you're an absolute fucker with that and yeah and i swear because <laughs> because yeah, yeah 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 because i'll tell you what if you if your listeners ever played a drinking game, right, and skipped through all of your podcasts and listened to every time you said, and how did that make you feel? <laughs> Fucking hell, they'd be arseholed. <laughs> the amount of times you asked that question. Anyway, sorry, but there's, there's, I digress. But, 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 but what do we get from it? What, what, what do we my, get from that question? What do we get from that question? Mm. Well, you get a connection. You, you find out what the connection is mm. emotionally. Yeah. Um, but I, from an, as an eight year old to a now 48 year old, um, I can't really remember much about how I felt at the time. I just knew that it felt amazing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to keep tapped into that sensation of oh, this feels amazing. And my wife says that I'm a fucking show off, which is true. And I think <laughs> I've always been a bit of a show off. And that is the thing that theatre gives me. It feeds that animal that is yeah. like, ah, look at me, look at me. The, the, the performer in you that's bursting to, yeah. to come it's out. It's constantly bursting to get out. Yeah. So where did what ha what happened next then? So you, so you did the, you did this show. Was you inst did you just I, I did instantly that show. know? Well, it's interesting because my parents split up and shortly after that show, so at the age of nine, my mum uh, met somebody and me and my brother moved into the middle of nowhere. We moved up to Kielder, which uh, for those that don't know Kielder, 
Have a look on Google Maps. See how populated Kiel the village I, is. Did I visit it with you? Is that where we meant to play golf? Uh, that was Bellingham. Okay. But that Similar. was a, that was a much more populated oh, place. Really? Yes. <laughs> uh, Kielder consists of three streets and a castle, and it is uh, slap bang in the middle of the largest UK no the largest man made forest in Europe. So. It was so remote, we had to get a booster box just to get a TV signal. And even then, the TV signal looked like it was snowing the whole time. <laughs> it was that, that out remote. of sticks. Mm -hmm. So uh, that completely pulled me away from any sort of impetus. I think had I stayed in Newcastle, the possibility is that I would have continued doing more theatre mm -hmm. there. But as a result, I ended up kind of detached from it. So I only went down to see my dad and my grandparents every other weekend. Um, Was so there yeah, a community I think... where you lived? Because when you're in theatre and you're doing theatre, you become part of the community, don't you? So I'm imagining now that you've been pulled away yeah. from these people that you got quite close to. I don't remember if I did get close to them. I feel mm. that I probably did. I, I have a distinct memory of going at the end of one performance, uh, going off stage, and there was uh, one of the the guys who played one of Joseph's brothers, who I think I had I I just had got a bit of a connection with, and and giving him a, like a, I was so like had so much energy and, and adrenaline through I gave him a great big hug and he patted me on the head mm -hmm. and I went off down into the dressing rooms. I think possibly had I stayed, there would have been that community, but I, I'm just going to cross my fingers because uh, I'll come back to something later. Okay. Um, I, yeah, possibly would have had a, been part of a community, but I was pulled away from that. And the new community that I found that I created in my new environment was through Cubs and Scouts. Okay. So that was kind of what carried me through then. So, so I have this thing with acting that I think it's really important to have a life outside of theatre. Mm. And so if you just stuck with theatre, yeah. would you have built up the skill sets that you needed later on in life to be good at your craft if you hadn't have had that pull away? If you hadn't have had that, if you'd have just stayed in it and just did that as your thing that you enjoy without the scouts, what did the scouts add to your craft? Well, uh, I'm very good at using a compass. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can make a fire. Yes, yeah. Um, I think with the scouts uh, helped nature a uh, hands-on being able to do stuff. So, you know, now I'm very good at building uh, sets and um, I'm very good at tying knots. That's good. And, yeah. it, and, and, the, and actually you say this like, like, like maybe it's not connected, but actually that, I'm, I'm so pleased you found that connection mm. because you now are a not just an actor, you're a theatre producer and you put on shows and yes, you build the sets. Yeah. You're there get, getting stuck in with creating the show. And when you create theatre, it isn't just about the performance, is it? No, oh God, there's no, no. So, there's so, much so much more. more. There's so, so much, much more. more to it than that. I'm doing a show at the minute. Um, well, we're about to start rehearsals. Mm -hmm. It's called Skirmishes. goes on uh, 18th to 21st of September. So I don't... Uh, no, so this will go out well, well before then. This it? is going to be going out on the 30th of July, like I said, the, oh, year, of course, yes. the year anniversary. And, um, yeah, we're about to go into rehearsal. Uh, I've already done the poster, had the flyers printed. I've managed to secure some corporate sponsors for the show to enable me to pay for the deposit for the theatre hire for the rights to perform the script, uh, to pay for all the printing and stuff like that. There's so many, so much that you've got to do before you even start the first rehearsal. Mm. Uh, I've got my lighting designer um, all set up, uh, the magnificent Mike Penketh. 
and um, and I'm approaching the first rehearsal. I should have a full cast, and I'm missing one of my main actresses now. Just so through how, how, many, how many people in the cast? Three. <laughs> <laughs> and you're missing, yeah. And it's effectively a two-hander because the third part is quite small, mm. uh, which, again, I've got some hugely talented actresses. So you're almost missing half the cast. Basically. I am missing <laughs> half the cast. Um, so there is um, hopefully going to be a discussion had with a potential replacement who... Uh, again, is an absolute magnificent actress who I've worked with in this very studio. Um, and, uh, yes, we'll see what happens with that. Um, but but, I, but you're working on that. We're, as we're, we're working we're on working that at the minute, yes. Yeah. It's strange how things happen. It might actually be more beneficial to the production. That well, I, I like I, to think there's an element of fate sometimes with certain things. I, I'm, I've come to the conclusion now that everything happens in the way that it happens for a reason. Yeah. That nothing happens by by accident or by chance. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if, if changes occur in the creative process, then it, it, it's often for the best. Yeah. Yeah. It kind yeah. of, it forces your hands. I suppose that's the one thing that, um, I don't, I don't know, is it Scouts that has helped me with that? The fact that you're faced with a situation and you've got to think, right, how do I work a solution out of this? Mm. And, you do, and with, you do a lot in theatre, have to find a solution. Yeah, to yeah, problems. yeah. Uh, and with Scouts, you're, kind of, you're, you're given these tasks. You're going, right, okay, you've got this bit of rope, you've got these uh, bits of stick, mm -hmm. you've got to get across this bridge... Uh, you've got to get across this river without a bridge. Mm -hmm. And you've got these various objects that you've got to carry across as well. Yeah. Off you go. And I think that is possibly where Scouts has really helped me mm -hmm. with regards to my ab ability to kind of try and think outside the box mm -hmm. and kind of go, all right, I've got this situation. It's, it's a problem and problems are there to be solved. Yes, yeah. How do I solve this? Um, and I've never really thought about that, actually. So, all right, yeah, I did call you a fucker for asking that question. <laughs> but that is, I've never thought, never really made the connections. One of the things that I've felt that I'm really good at within theatre is improv. Mm -hmm. And possibly is that because at quite a young age, my brain has been wired to go, all right, how do you think around the problem? Mm -hmm. What's the solution to this? And so the, the ability to be able to think on my feet. There's been situations where I've been on stage, on the main stage at the Playhouse, mm -hmm. in the middle of a full-on panto performance, and the curtain is rising up, and my fellow actress, who I'm about to do a little bit of banter with, has forgotten to come on stage. She's busy chatting in the dressing room. You know who you are. Uh, and uh, and so I had to just we we were mid show. It mm. was like there was there was no like getting about. You it. can't you can't pause. You, you can't, can't pause. Uh, oh, like, hold on a second. Hold on. Let me just hold a second. Pause. Let me just girls. go and get. Uh, I'm just gonna go off. And, uh, uh, yeah. So I ended up having a conversation with myself. Mm. I managed to rewrite the script very quickly in my head to go oh I was like, oh have a little think about it. oh and it's like i was then thinking out loud mm -hmm. instead of having a conversation and then we were able just to kind of move the script on move and forward. get to the next scene mm -hmm. but yeah that was oh, and sick. could you yeah could you have done that without those tasks that you've had in scouts without those problem solving tasks where you had to think differently because in in a lot of normal life growing up and especially at school i think we're taught to in our in my day at school for sure uh, i'm not sure how much it's moved on now but it was almost like you need to learn this subject and think about getting from a to b and then that's it but in life it doesn't work like that in, in creativity no, no. it doesn't work like that there's something in between a and b yeah that we need to 
Well, actually, the, the route is you're going from A to Z. Mm. Is what it is. The end destination has always got to be Z. Yes. And it's all the different steps that you've got to take along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's never just A to B. No. It never is. It's always, there's always little bits and bobs. And I, I guess when you look at a problem face on, it looks like it's A to B. When you look at it at first. I mean, sometimes know. I'll react <laughs> like it's A to B. And, and I go, oh my God, oh no, this is it. This is all, it's all doom and gloom. It's all, yes. oh, damn it. All right, okay, just take a moment, take a breath. <laughs> all right, okay, let's have a think about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, it's that, yeah. And, and of course, I think one of the things, because I did Cubs and Scouts as well, I think teamwork. Do, 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 do you see cadets? Air well? cadets. Air cadets. Air cadets. That was a massive... I learned so much from air cadets. Air cadets was great for me. What, that you've brought into theatre? Into life. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, just... The air cadets was... Yeah, was huge. It was... Um, confidence building. Yeah, problem solving. Problem solving, like, the next level of problem solving. Mm. And staying calm within difficult situations. Yeah. Which that's something I've definitely taken into life. Right. Staying calm at a diff difficult time, um, under under extreme pressures, because I think that's taking you from from kind of like that that Cubs scenario, yeah, where you've got to work out how to get the sticks across the other side of a river, um, but in air cadets it'll be like right now you've got to get the sticks to the other side of the river, but you've got to keep them completely dry because on the other side of the river you've got to start fire. Um, and you've got to go through the water. So, oh. so, so it's so. Oh, yeah. okay. So, it, right. so it's, oh, it's, it's yeah. like right. So now you've got to you've got to actually go in the water, and you've got to keep the sticks dry. And, and then because it's and, air cadets, you then got to fly a plane as well. <laughs> you then got to jump in a plane, and, and no, and things like that. Like at, at six, I, I flew a plane at like fifteen years old. Wow! Holy shit! Yeah, I, you know that. I'm so glad I lived up north. <laughs> <laughs> what was there not air cadets up north? I'm sure no, no, is. I just didn't want to be near you while you're flying. <laughs> oh, <the> well, <laughs> <laughs> that was quite good at it, actually. The oh, loop, the loops, and <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. I was not allowed to join any uh, forces because I'm colour blind. Yes, yes, you definitely. So are. I, I found out from an early age that any sort of like that sort of uh, army, police, mm -hmm. firefighting is a no go for me. Well, I, I, I became turned off of the idea a little bit because of my eyesight as well, actually. Oh. So being in the being in the RAF, you have to have perfect 20-20 vision. Oh, okay. And at that point in my life, I had very, very poor vision. Yeah. I had big, thick yeah. bottle. Oh, bottle I, rem glasses. I remember when you, before you had your laser eye surgery. Yes, yeah. You used to have to wear I, glasses. I still can't use the lasers. They're still not working. I'm still trying to figure <laughs> out. Because <laughs> I was convinced Martin, that I'd be Martin, left with some kind of You are of not Clark Kent. <laughs> How but many I times have I got to tell you? But I paid all that money for laser vision. <laughs> and what happened? Nothing. <laughs> I can see clearly. Yeah. Oh, well, I think you oh. need to be grateful just for that. Yeah, no, I am very grateful, actually. That was a that was a, a wise move to get my eyes. I've had to start wearing glasses now. Have you? Yeah. Only I'd for be, reading. I'd be, I'd be interesting to see that. Yeah. <laughs> actually, if you have a look on my uh, Thompson Promotions website, mm -hmm. there is a photograph of me in my glasses. Is there? Yeah. All right. I'll, da I'll download it and, yeah. and mock you for yeah. it. So uh, just uh, thompsonpromotions.co.uk. Just, we'll just yeah. keep adding yeah, in. Just, just go, every yeah, now yeah. and then we'll add in yeah. a little bit of promotion. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, let's get, let's get back to, to, the, to your journey. Yeah. Let's, so you moved away. You were ice, isolated. Uh, yeah. From, well, from, yeah. from from the theatre world, yes. for sure. Yeah. So oh, how did, did you find your way back? So um, there was, after a few years, we moved to uh, Bellingham, which is spelt Bellingham, but pronounced Bellingham because course, it's a cause... Northumbrian pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Northumberland and you see like Ovingham and, and Bellingham and things like that, it's, it's Ovingham and mm -hmm. Bellingham and stuff like that. I had a, there was me, there was Carl Davison, and there was Terry Shields, and there was three, uh, especially me and Carl, not so much Terry, but me and Carl used to do creative stuff, and uh, we used to write stories and set each other, we, you got to remember that at this time it was like, 
there weren't really computers. If you wanted to like play a computer game, you had to hope that one of us had a ZX Spectrum and that you spent half an hour on it loading, loading the tape. a cassette. And that it loaded correctly. And that it loaded correctly. <laughs> and if it, it didn't, yeah. then you'd have to start the process yeah, again. Because with the tape, if you started the tape at like a, a second out of sync, yeah. then it wouldn't load and you, you waited that 15 minutes to half an hour exactly, and nothing would happen. Exactly. And uh, me and Carl used to do like writing. Um, we would uh, give each other the title of the story and then we'd give each other the first word of the sentence and we'd try and like throw each other under the bus as much as possible. Mm -hmm. The weirdest words, right, start that next sentence with that word. And then we'd kind of like, we'd read what each other had written and mm -hmm. it, it was fun. To the point where me and Carl actually started to write a novel together. And it was about, um, and it's probably a story that's been done loads of times, but about a boy who uh, discovers that he's a virus in a computer program. And I think probably because me and Carl enjoyed Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and stuff there like that. There was elements of there that. There was elements it? of that. We were, I mean, I've got my uh, Doctor Who t-shirt on, um, you know, big fans of Doctor Who, uh, big fans of Red Dwarf. Mm -hmm. You know, we had so many things that we kind of like could tap into. Um, yeah, and so this boy were, discovers he's part of a, he's a virus in a computer program and uh, and he then somehow saves the world. We never got to the end of the story, <laughs> but we would sort of like write a chapter each. I can't remember how far we got into it. I think we got quite far into it. Does it matter how far you got into it? Is, is it is it more about the process and the doing I mean, yeah, of it? Yeah, I think the... it was about the process and mm. the fact that, you know, we had to appreciate each other's writing style and we probably modified our true style to f get a more cohesive kind of uh, rhythm. Mm. Um, but again, it's like one of the many projects that I've started where I've started writing something and I've never finished it. And um, I've started writing another book now. It's not a um, like a narrative. It's about uh, public speaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the stages you go through to become uh, a, a competent, comfortable, confident public speaker. Mm -hmm. That's the aim of that, that book. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm into chapter two. Uh, I had to uh, modify the end of chapter one after we did that circle because about the audience. Because it got Alex, you, it got uh, you Alex thinking. Outlaw, of... Yeah, Alex Outlaw threw a curveball at me right at the very end. And the only the one I remember is Don't Be a Dickhead. <laughs> Don't Be a Dickhead, yeah. yeah. <laughs> was that the curveball? Yeah, no, no, no. So the curveball was about um, the difference between um, having the confidence to not listen to the naysayers and just get up there and do it. But at the same time, understanding your audience. Because... Niall, we got into a little bit of debate where Niall said something about how the audience isn't important. And I went, oh, no, 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 it's very important. And uh, and then continued to talk about how you don't listen to the naysayers. And I just went, but you said that they were important. Now you're saying that you don't listen to them. So within and your, I was like, you contradicted yourself. You were yeah, like, yeah, yeah. hold on, I've got some, something to think about now. Yes. Like, <laughs> So then I'd had to go back to the end of my first chapter mm -hmm. and clarify the difference between your audience, mm. so the people who are there to support you, who won't just criticise you, but will give you constructive feedback on how you can improve things, which is what I feel I did to you right at the beginning when I was listening to the early podcasts. I was like, oh, try not to do that. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and then listening and not listening to what I class as the others who are there just to pull you down because they're either jealous of your success or they just don't think that whatever it is, there's, there's some sort of personal reason why they're trying to pull you down. Mm -hmm. So I was working, I had one session with this woman um, who as an Instagram person, she has like over half a million followers on Instagram. She does uh, like fitness videos and uh, sort of healthy food videos, but hated her speaking voice because 
her children and husband told her that she sounded like a child just because she had a slightly higher pitched voice and I was trying to have this sort of like in the end that the first session ended up trying to be more like a, a therapy session more than me actually giving her the mechanics of how she can start talking on her videos um, and we never had another session after that and I think she just was allowing her immediate others I've which done, I've didn't done, want that for whatever reason they the kids were embarrassed that she was doing these videos I've done that for most of my life with yeah. also with people that don't necessarily matter so I've, I've voices of negative people not even in my immediate circle but in the circle outside of that that have made small comments but I've allowed those small comments to become huge. So they get in at the end and they're mm. kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of going, oh, you should do it like that. You should do it like that. Or well, you, you can't do it. Oh, One of the big ones is you can't do that. Yeah. Excuse me? Like, oh, yeah. now, I, 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 someone said to me a week ago, oh. you, you can't do that. And I went, oh, I'm really sorry you think that if I'm doing it. <laughs> Like, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done with with you know. I'm nearly forty. Don't tell me I can't yeah. do anything. And what you know, one thing I'm really conscious of is is my teeth, mm. and that's because quite a few years ago, somebody said to me, "Oh, you'll never." Um, you know, I, I, you know, maybe they're right because I'm not a successful. I'm not a professional actor. I get occasional acting, paid acting work, but. Mm. Um, they said, oh, you'll never make it in the industry because uh, you've got bad teeth. Oh, okay. I was like... Mm, and you took that? Are... Oh, God, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's... So, oh, there, there, there's yeah, always there, been a... Because it is a struggle for all of us navigating these creative pursuits. But when we get that small negative feedback or negative comment, we take that as the reason why it's not working as the defined success and, and maybe that that's somewhere that that we need to look at restructuring what is what is success well what is success to you is going to be different to what it is to someone else and then and then that thing of the audience why are we looking why are we concentrating on what the success is to them at all <laughs> for I, you. I suppose it's defined by your goals isn't it mm -hmm. really you know for me doing the show in september um, is what I deem as success for that show is that I break even. My actors have a wonderful experience and gain something from it. And my audience go away going, that was an amazing bit of acting. Whether they enjoy it, whether they feel comfortable, not so important the fact that they appreciated the craft on stage that the they appreciate the hard work that the actors are, are, will be putting into that performance you know it's about a mother who is dying and two siblings squabbling about it mm -hmm. um which is a story that can be related time and time again even in some of the initial read-throughs with the actors you know they've they've got their own connections to the theme uh, the, of the subject matter that we're we're looking at. You know the Jez Butterworth play that is uh, just being on in West End. The Lakes play is about sisters around a mother dying. You know it's a theme that continues on and on and on. Um, uh, so uh, in fact, Heath players are doing the Memory of Water this November, which is about family coming together. Uh, around the death of a mother a again Quite. these these themes because they are so personal to people in life and you just yeah hopefully everyone will connect to the show in some way shape or form and if they make a connection it might emotionally i've just knocked the mic, mic there hopefully i'm just done no the red light's still on um uh you know, if if it emotionally connects to some members of the audience, great. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't, hopefully, again, they'll just appreciate the craft. But for me, that is what is deemed as success. 
again, referring back to the circle, the Noel Phillips, he mentioned about doing the workshops and I said, oh, wouldn't very successfully. And he immediately went, oh, no, 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 I don't, don't use the word success. Don't, I don't, I don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable with that. So, you know, what is success to one person is different, is to, different to another. And I always think I'm quite hard on myself, I think, with that definition of success. success. But then sometimes I take a step back when I talk to people outside of the creative world and they go to me, I can't believe you just put on a, a show. I'd love to do that. Just doing that. There are millions of people out there that would love to be involved with these things, like put on a theatre show, yeah. like act on a stage, even like <laughs> even find the time to, to paint or draw. <laughs> What was this triggered? Jim? No, 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 it's just triggered. So, so um, I did a production of uh, Alan Bourne's Confusions, and uh, one of the guys who auditioned, he read really well, uh, but turned out he had no acting experience whatsoever. And uh, he, he was one of those people who had been in the theatre and looked at it and gone, well, that looks really easy. I could do that. But then once he, once he got into the mechanics of learning a script and learning how to move and talk and act all at the same time, oh my God, he was like given the instruction of, well, if you're talking, you shouldn't really have your back to the audience. So then he started moving around the stage where he was always facing the front and he was like moving backwards. It was like, what are you moving like that for? That's not natural. Do you walk like that in real life? No. Well, why are you moving like that? Well, you said, don't turn your back to the audience. I said, no, no, just. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I had to work a lot with him. And there, <laughs> there was one moment during a performance and uh, one of the other actors dried on stage. It was, it was just one of those shows that was littered with little bits and bobs where it was like, oh God. <laughs> and uh, Ground was swallowing me up yeah, kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, he was off stage and there was nothing, and I was in the audience as director, just watching this car crash happening. Because <laughs> it doesn't always work, does it? No, no, no. As a, as a director as well, you know, you've only got so much input where you can kind of direct people and mm -hmm. a, and give them all the instructions. But the minute the curtain goes up on that first performance, that is kind of it. As a director, go. you've got I like, got okay, oh my god. It's like um like you've got horses on a carriage, mm. right? And you're going along and you're going, all right, okay, this is the point where I have to literally let go of the reins and the horses have got to hopefully remember where they're going mm. because we've got to get there at the end no matter what. And yeah, so I was I'd let go of the reins. If opening night had gone fine. This was the second night performance and he you often hear this though, you, know, you get second night dip, mm -hmm. where people get a bit of c complacency because the first night went so well and they go, oh, oh that I'm, was a breeze, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, great at this, darling. Oh <laughs> my God, I was marvellous, wasn't I? Uh, and then you get the second night and things slip because of that complacency that creeps in. And this was the second night and yeah, like I said, one of the actors dried on stage uh, for those of the... that don't know the policy. When you dry on stage, it means that you've literally forgotten all your your lines. And there is nothing, your, the, your head has lost. become an empty You're void. Lost. Yeah. Mm. And uh, this guy who had thought acting was a breeze was off stage. And uh, it was actually one of the first shows my wife and I worked on together. Um, she was backstage and um, this is before we were even together, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, she was like, what, what, what are you doing? And he was going, I'm waiting for my line. <laughs> and she said, it ain't fucking coming. You better get on. <laughs> and she literally like kind of pushed him out. And, mm -hmm. and he went out and he started talking and mm -hmm. the, the show continued. But mm -hmm. after that show, he came up to me and went, nah, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> that was far too scary. Because it's not for everyone. Is it? This, it's not this, for everyone. It's not for everyone, this, this lifestyle. No. And, it, and it's something you said quite interesting there about letting, when you're a director and you let the reins go and you just have to hope 
I hope it just, you know, every, all the work that you've put in pans out the way that you, that you want it to. Yeah. Have you ever had a show where you let go of the brains, but then you had to dive in and, and help it again? Because I, I have. Yes, all the time. I am a, um, I am a constant tweaker. Mm -hmm. So um, I will, in the interval, I will go chat to the cast. I will kind of go, right guys, that was, that was great. You just let the energy dip a bit when you go out in the second half. It's like a manager of a football team, really, for mm -hmm. me. Um, uh, you've, uh, yeah, just think about this, think about that, blah, 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 off you go. And then at the end of the show, I'll go, right, I'll do like a debrief of how the performance went. I go, right. So it's constant note giving. Mm -hmm. constant adjusting and tweaking and reminding people of like, things that they've done and things that they've said it's like being a conductor isn't it yeah yeah I suppose I've never I, to be honest I've never really fully understood what what a conductor does apart from <laughs> keep the, the rhythm of the, and I, the and, orchestra and that's what because, he continues to do as a director yeah the orchestra the have boat. got their, their notes they're playing mm -hmm. their parts uh, but it's just the conductor keeping them... Keeping them in check, yeah. keeping them in line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sp yeah, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Never thought of that. Um, yeah, there's been some times where people have come off on stage, like on a, like a big show, where I've got l so many moving parts, um, especially when you're dealing with kids. Kids need constant repetition. Mm -hmm. And you constantly need to be, so, all right, okay, like, don't do that again. What you did there, you looked out at your mum. Your mum doesn't exist, you know. <laughs> You're a fairy in the middle of the woods. Mm -hmm. You're not little Susie who's on stage <laughs> uh, looking out to see if her mum's turned up at the show, all right? You're a fairy. Remember that. Like, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, you know, I I have been known to be very angry and swear at my uh, cast. Yeah, because in, in, told... in the moment, it can be quite hard, can't it? It can be quite stressful. Like they, yeah, they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, it doesn't I, matter how good you are at this, and even some of the biggest professionals well, I've ever yeah, met the end, have been very stressful. Like, see, we're, we're dealing with amateur theatre. These are people who are doing stuff in their spare time. It's a hobby. Yeah, but I've seen it in the professional that, world as oh, well, the stress. Yeah. You don't eliminate... The stress doesn't just get eliminated just yeah. through through that, that difference from amateur theatre to professional. No, and probably is, there's more so. I mean, you hear about all these sort of, like, divas throwing their toys out of a pram and uh, directors who won't work with certain actors and things like that and actors yeah. who end up with uh, they've got a reputation for being difficult to work with mm -hmm. um, which is all, all strikes me as being odd why you would make life difficult I, I tried I, one of the things I try and go through life is by not making things difficult and try and just make everything as easy as possible for everyone I think sometimes you come across people, like I think you meet people that you can work well with and that you gel with and that you connect with. And then I think at other times in life you meet people that, that you don't connect with and you don't gel with and you can't work well with. Yeah. And I think there's different personality types that do, that either connect. Yeah. Yeah. Or they, or they, or they oppose. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, yeah. Um, and I think people like like me and you over the years, I think we've come together quite quite a lot on different things, haven't we? Yes, we have. Um, and then yeah, and I, then I can think of other people who I've worked with once that I'll never work with again. Yeah. That I, I, that yeah and yeah, but you, you, there's always learning, isn't there? There's always learning all the time. Like when like you, you directed you, know you directed Dracula, and I was your production manager. Yes. Yeah. And I learned a very valuable lesson then of keeping an eye on the budget. <laughs> Yeah, because there's diff different people have got different skill sets. Yeah. So for me at that time, budget wasn't something that I wanted to consider. I had a creative vision and I wanted it to happen. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't you, want to think about yeah, money. You were like hiring <laughs> these gothic um, like chandeliers. Where does and... money come into this oh vision? Oh my God. Well, we, the thing is, we sold out. We pretty much sold out mm. the entire show, Dracula. It was yes, like, yeah. uh, it was. It and this was, a, uh, this was early days of the internet as well. Like, the internet yeah, yeah, was around, yeah. but we weren't going, oh, sell well, tickets online. 
Were we? That was because we no, didn't. That was that was that the, was the turning point. Of yeah. We must sell tickets. So right. the ticketing was basically people phoned up and said, "Can I have two tickets for Thursday night?" And you wrote them on a piece of paper, such and such one, two tickets for Thursday night, and then you hoped that they turned up and yeah. gave you some cash, mm -hmm. because if they didn't, that was it. There was no comeback or anything. No. There was no. We were very lucky with that show that we... Because I, I remember that with the cast, we had a bit of a competition going on. Who could, who sell, could, the most tickets, who yeah. could sell the most tickets? And I think a few people fibbed. Because we'd sold tickets to people that didn't show up. Yeah. But luckily, we had people at the door every night wanting seats. So where yeah. then ones didn't show up because, because yeah. someone just wanted to win a competition. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that uh, yeah that we still got we still got bums bums on seats, but um... but yeah, I think um, I don't know. We've got so I need to kind of get back on track with my story. I That's suppose. exactly what I was thinking because yeah. we got onto your you were doing the writing with your friends. You and found then... it, and and isn't that a nice thing to do? And my little nephew, I call him little. He's nearly ten. I shouldn't call him little anymore. Ten's it's quite quite about, yeah. quite a big age to be. At um, that age, it is it, anyway. It definitely is it's, at that age. Uh, yeah. you, you know, you're, you're, you're moving in up. This in this end world. of the spectrum, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he's definitely not little. He's definitely growing into, you know, growing up quickly. Yeah. Um, but he does that. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And I, and, and I, and I, I really, think, yeah, I, I like that. I like he, it. It's, it's good that you get that creative. He does, he does that with his friends. He, he writes with his friends and that's his brilliant. friends give him like a prompt and then he'll come up with a story. Oh, wow. Well, that's yeah, really, exactly, yeah. Exactly. Uncanny. The, exactly the same thing. Yeah. So the, um, well, we, we stopped writing because, uh, we'd actually, we'd started doing our GCSEs and then got into A levels and then, he went off to a uh, university in Preston and I'd originally applied uh, to do Russian and English uh, degree at uh, Nottingham Trent University or Bangor University in, uh, in Wales. And unfortunately, I, uh, I didn't really pass my levels. <laughs> I wasn't clever enough. Um, so I ended up weirdly falling back into doing a performing arts course at Newcastle College and over the course of about a few years I came out the other end with a higher national diploma in performing arts specialising in drama. Um, the course below and the year before so a lot of the people who joined my course um, they'd done the national diploma um, and a couple of people um, called Ant and Deck were on that course. I don't know what happened to them. Never heard of them. No. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on. Bike Grove was going on at the time. Uh, I ended up doing stuff with uh, the company uh, Zenith North who made Bike Grove from the BBC. I spent an entire day running up and down a flight of stairs as Charles Dickens um, in the uh, National... It was, it, there's a like a, a library in Newcastle, which looks like... When you open the doors, it looks like it could be like out of Hogwarts. You would expect like books to be flying out of shelves and things like that. It's got that really old Victorian feel to it and there were loads of like really old books so you could see why it was chosen for that um but yeah there was loads of stuff going on lots of like other people who've gone on to to do stuff professionally in, in the industry uh but during that course i um was auditioning for other things going on and uh like one of uh one of the auditions there was like a, a notice saying auditions in this room uh, today, I was like, all right, okay, let's turn up then. And uh, I did an audition piece and it was for a production of Alice Through the Looking Glass, which is the follow on to Alice in Wonderland, the uh, novel wise. And is actually the one which has Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Uh, so the, the Disney one is sort of like a mix, a mix of characters from uh, 
it, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass all kind of get me merged together. Um, and I uh, got the part of Humpty Dumpty. And he was a singing, dancing, six foot egg. <laughs> and a great costume for it. Mm -hmm. And it was being performed at the Gulbenkian studio in Newcastle. And we went through all the rehearsals and uh, we got, uh, we're doing the get in and we were in the theatre and they put up a display uh, in the foyer of the history of the, this theatre company. And it was, um, it was called Rainbow Theatre Productions. And I was looking at the history of it and the, said about how this theatre company started uh, by uh, acquiring the rights to Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat um, from uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. And I was like, oh, that, was, that was the show that got me started. Mm. And I ran back into the auditorium and was like, I, you, I, I, got, I was in this foot and they were like, oh my God, this is... This is amazing. You've kind of kind of come full circle, mm. and you, like the first time that you've done another theatre show in Newcastle, and it's with the same theatre company. Like, gone as how many years later? I was twenty. I was twenty at the time. So yeah, so twelve years later, and fear that, that, Well, that's going me back, back to, in. We touched on it earlier. That it's almost like you're you're meant to be. Like yeah. it's meant. It was meant to be. It was yeah. meant to happen that way. So, um, so yeah, so that, that I did that, graduated, um, my mum had married somebody, uh, Trevor, uh, who lives in Harlow, and I got to the end of my course, and the, the plan was, I'll move down here, I'll spend a bit of time with my mum, and get an agent, get some work in London, and I got a job. Was it, coming from up north, did you look at the south as somewhere that had more opportunity oh god it was like dick whittington was like oh my god <laughs> london the streets are paved with gold um, and what was the reality well the reality was that i had to live i had to get a job and i got easily distracted mm -hmm. if you look back at all of my um school uh reports when i was a kid the overriding thing is he daydreams a lot <laughs> he gets easily distracted and uh, I think that's still the case today, really. Um, and yeah, I got distracted. I, I got a job uh, uh, where what is now Primark, the upstairs of Primark. Uh, Primark was uh, Littlewoods. And um, upstairs there was a cafe. And I got a job working in the cafe because I used to work in catering. I used to work at the hotel in Bellingham. And um, we... I was, uh, the, my line manager was a lady called Mrs. Glenister. And Mrs. Glenister's daughter, Laura, um, did stuff at the Playhouse and met her partner. And for those that have seen the other podcasts, Boo Miller is Mrs. Glenister's granddaughter. Wow. Uh, Mrs. Glenister introduced me to people at the Playhouse. Uh, so through that, I met, they met Phil Dale, um, Brian Herring, um, uh, lots of other... Uh, so, you became, Miller. so there was a there was a big community already happening yeah. here in this building. Oh, there was already, yeah, and yeah. I kind of and came you, in. And you, and you found your way into that. I found my way into it. I auditioned <laughs> uh, with, as Brian Herring said, an accent thicker than a wheel omelette. <laughs> and I got the part of Rickshaw in Aladdin. Uh, understudy for Wishy Washy and there was a big reason for me to specifically learn the part of Wishy Washy and that's because Darren uh, Pratt uh, who was a serving police officer couldn't do all the performances because it was a community panto none of us were getting paid it was all so you, you know, still when you when you've got a community panto happening yeah everyone's still got their job exactly to go, to go exactly. to and, and so you have to find find a way to make it fit into life and sometimes you, you can't <laughs> yeah exactly um so sometimes you say like i want, really want to do this but i can't do all the performances and if you've got a 
especially with a cast as big as that was, because you could then say, right, you understudy this part, and then you who are in senior chorus, you can understudy this smaller part, mm -hmm. and then it can all kind of work out well. So Danny Gleason, who again has been on the podcast, uh, he was my understudy for Rickshaw. So there were some performances where I was um, wishy-washy, he was Rickshaw, apart from the penultimate show where Darren was wishy-washy and I let Danny do rickshaw and I actually got to sit in the auditorium and watch the show which I'd never done which was nice but yeah from that I made all of my sort of like connections and started doing stuff at Vicky Hall because I met Anthony Osborne um who'd probably be quite a good person so so, so when you when you get into a theatre community when you when you do one show it leads to so many other things, doesn't it? Oh, it, God, Because the, yeah. the, the, the networks branch out well, in many you've different hit, directions. You've hit the nail on the head there, network. Mm -hmm. it's a net, you, you're chatting to people, you are networking, uh, subconsciously you're networking. You don't, you don't realise you realize it. Realize it, do you? But it's very the impression natural. you make on that one person, because they then, especially somewhere like Harlow, there are so many theatre companies and so many theatre companies, the next step out. So you've got all your Hertfordshire uh, connections, mm -hmm. you've got your Heath connections, you've got your Stortford connections, you've got your Loughton connections. It all branches out. Mm. And there's like people go, oh, I'm doing a show uh, with such and such. You'd be really great to audition for, because mm. we, we haven't got really got anybody to fit that role. And I think you'd probably be a good shoe in. Because all it, there's there's tiny hints of nepotism all around. Because I think we I mentioned this when we did the circle about how you know any sort of industry has a an incestuous nature because you're working with people and you see how they work and how they work well and you think actually that'd be a good I person. I think there's to a work there's a with. little bit of comfort in that nepotism. There is a little bit of, if, if if especially when I do this professionally, I want to know that I am going to be working with reliable people. Yeah, that is my first box. Oh, that God, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't know that about someone new because an an actor will come into an audition room and you you they'll do their piece and you'll say, how reliable are you going to be over the next six weeks? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm there for I'm there for you every day. I'll be there for you now. And, and like they ah. promise the world to yeah, you. And yeah, I've seen yeah, it and yeah. I've seen it a million times. Yeah. Or or and you might have like where you go, you, you say, right, I've got this show. Would you be able to do it? And and you kind of have a few read throughs, and you go, oh my god, this is fucking fucking amazing. Mm. You go, right, okay. Um, so we're looking at the dates of the show, and they go, mm. something starts. To, yeah, the I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I can't do that date. Is there any flexibility on the dates? You go. Let me see what I can do. Okay, no, no, it's fine. We can move it to this other date. Is that all right? Mm. Because especially if you've got like a small cast and if you've got a small cast that you are, you know, it has to be those those guys and you go, all right, OK. Um, you know, in this very auditorium, I did teachers for the second time. And for me, it was very important uh, to have the same cast. So it was Kirsty, Ben Parsley, who's been on, uh, ben, yeah, and uh, Amy Jaggers. And, uh you know, we were kind of like going, all right, when when, when are we all available to do this? And so the rehearsal process was a bit patchy mm -hmm. uh, and we all agreed on this one particular week. Turns out it was two weeks before lockdown kicked in, mm -hmm. which was quite fortuitous because had we have done it any later, we could have lost everything. And again, again, meant to be, it it meant to, be, meant to yeah. happen at that time. And uh, yeah, but then you, there's like, uh, Sometimes you, you then move the dates and it's all great, great, great. And then they go, ah, oh, someone come up with work. Oh, I'm not going to be able to do those dates again. And then you've got to make a decision of going, all right, okay, that's, that's not going to happen then. But then you will not look at that person again. No, it's very, it's Even very if they are the perfect person the for that part in, world, in that yeah. next show that you're doing, you will not go because to Because organizing something like theater there's many things involved 
other than just putting an actor in There's a role. There's so much stress. And so once you've got an actor in a role, if that actor then has to, if that actor can't be reliable for whatever reason, yeah, it throws so much out. I I the ripple didn't effect. Didn't get lots of parts mm. because I. Uh, late twenties, early thirties, because I was unreliable. Mm. Uh, I had a professional acting job touring around the country, which I then stopped getting work from because I was unreliable, mm. and that was a big lesson for me. That was a big learning curve of going. Oh right, okay. I need to need sort to out. I need to sort because it doesn't matter what ta- talent you've got here. Yeah. And and that goes back to me and Air Cadets. Air Cadets taught me to be reliable. And I'd say that's something that's always been through everything that I've done. Yeah. And I've I've as an actor, I'd say one of my weakest areas has been auditioning. Been I've been I've been a terrible auditioner. But once I've got the part and I've been in with people, I've always gone back and done more stuff with them. And it's yeah. not because of my skill set. I know it's because of the reliability. Because I hire people on the <laughs> Sorry, I know it's not. I'm not I know very a terrible actor. actor. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, let's, let's go to something. Here's, here's an example where I know I've been a bad actor. Oh, okay. Willows. Willows, I was never a child performer. I never, within my skill set was I a performer that should be getting on stage as a scarecrow singing Old MacDonald Had a Farm with animals? Yes, with a Shetland pony. Yeah, with a Shetland pony. Holding a chicken. <laughs> holding a chicken, holding a duck. <laughs> like, yeah. that, it just, my, that just doesn't fit in with my skill sets at all. However, you and Caroline kept asking me to go back there because you knew that I would be there every day on time and do the job. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's why hey, Caroline... you weren't actually as bad as you're making out. But there. but it still didn't fit in with my skill set. I think it? it was you were not comfortable. You were not as comfortable doing those shows. No, as no. me and Caroline were. But you knew I'd be but there. But there was an element of improv in that as well because mm. you had to react. Well, look, at that respond. time, at that time, didn't, I didn't know improv. No, I, exactly. I was like, I'm never, I'm never doing improv. No. <laughs> I want, I want to be given a script and direction, and I, yeah. I don't want to make things up on the spot. I can't do that um, because other voices have told me I can't do that. Uh, so, whereas now, yeah, I can do improv. Yeah, well, this is <laughs> sort of like this know, is just, improv. Yeah, this is responding to what you're being given and and making something making from it. Something yeah. From it. yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I know 100% Willows, you and Caroline employed me. And that's why Caroline asked me to work for her last year. Yeah. Because she knew that she could call on me and ask me to be somewhere at a certain time, certain day, yeah. and do the thing that's required. Yeah. Now I'm one of those people who is fastidious about making sure I'm there, not just on time, but I'm there early, mm-hmm. so I can get started. One, and... another step up. And yeah, that, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not just, just being It's not just it's you'll being... do the task, you'll go above and beyond the yeah. task. Yeah, yeah. And to the point where now people, you know, I started doing networking for my graphics business, mm-hmm. and I became then such a, a part of that group that the, the person who owns the networking group said will you host will you kind of run the meetings for me when i can't be there mm-hmm. and now i yeah i'm sort of you know i've become mr dependable of like well don't worry because jim's going to be there and if jim's there then everything's going to be work tickety boo mm-hmm. um and i think i think i'm now thinking about i know quite a few younger performers and i look at them and they're working so hard on their their skill set and their talent within the art that they want to do that then though these things like reliability and going above and beyond outside of the the performance i think they they don't focus on that enough i think the the trouble with some young performers is they get a bit too much up inside themselves Mm -hmm. uh, in the respect of that they are kind of there's a certain amount of smoke blowing up their arse because you, they're talented. And you, and it but what they then do degree. is they become a bit complacent in all the other skill sets that mm-hmm. you have to do with it. You don't you don't just have to be a good singer, actor and dancer. 
you, you have to be reliable. You have to have that commitment. You have to be able to turn up there ready to start, not rolling in like with 20 minutes already well, everyone else has warmed up and it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to rock up and uh, do my thing and uh, everything's going to be grand because you can't, you can't do that. So how do you think we could help younger performers understand the value of these broader skills outside of the, the talent? Well, that's interesting because we are sitting here in the playhouse and I'm aware that in May, there was the sort of like festival of sort of like new talent mm -hmm. going on here, and I think that is very important that young younger people get involved in putting on shows, having mentors to do it as well. Um, because I've seen some shows where you're kind of sitting there, you're watching, and you're like, somebody just needed to give them a guiding hand. Because mm -hmm. there's lots of basic errors going on. Like you can see so much potential yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in people, can't you? And you go, wow, they have they have got talent, but they've missed something. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you, and you can't see that, can you? No, no, you need an external pair of eyes. I, I directed a production of Death on the Nile, Murder on the Nile. I can't remember which way around it is. Agatha Christie did... I want to say it's... Well, they, no, they, there's, there's both. Oh, there is both. Because there's the novel, mm -hmm. and, then, and then Agatha Christie actually wrote a play. Okay. But one of them is called Death on the Nile, and the other one's called Murder on the Nile. Well, I'd say Murder on the Nile yeah. is the play then. So, That's, um, I'd like to be told that I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Murder on the Nile is the play. Yeah. Well, well here we go. Yeah. Um, and I was directing it, and Bernard Mool, who again has been on the podcast. Oh, uh, there's, there's been a few podcasts. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. mentioned today. Uh, well, that's how it's <laughs> interconnected and in, in incestuous, I suppose it is. And um, he came in and sat in uh, one of my rehearsals. And I was, you know, I looked up at Bernard, and, uh, you know, he's uh, somebody who's been there and had many, many years of experience of directing plays and things like that. And one of the things that he said is, what, why, why have you got dead space? I said, what do you mean dead space? He said, what, what you're doing is you've got somebody coming in, doing the line, and they're leaving. And then once they've left, you've got somebody else coming in, and they're hitting their mark, and then they're talking. And they said, he said, people don't move like that in real life. If they're talking, maybe have them talking while they're exiting. And maybe have a little overlap of people, you know, if they're meant to see each other, um, great. If they're not, if they're specifically not meant to see each other, then make sure that you take that in mind. But don't worry about having little scrappy overlaps and little rough edges, because mm. that is life. And that just makes the performance a bit more natural. And it stops there being quite so much dead space. And most importantly, it keeps the pace of the performance going. You see this a lot, particularly in amateur dramatics. Yeah. They'll do the scene and then they'll just wander off. Yeah. And in that moment, oh, there's an audience. There are times where you see somebody going, oh, I'm going to do some acting. And then I stop. Uh, yeah. Stop. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, it's my life. Right, 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 I'll do some acting. Yeah. Yeah. Lawrence so, gave that to me. My, my first, my first mentor yeah. gave that to me is don't stop until you're out of this room. Yeah. Like, you're in this room, you're in this space, you are that part. Yeah. Once you go out there, back to the dressing room, be Martin again. Uh, but in here, no. Yeah. Uh, another another person who influences how I direct, and I, I touched on this on the very first one, mm. but we never got, I never got to expand on it, is uh, Alan Jones uses uh, buttons. Yes. Yeah. So he has a 2D drawing of the stage uh, with all the set and furniture and stuff like that. And he has, each person has a button. And what he does uh, is he moves the buttons around. Mm -hmm. So you get a sense of flow across the stage with your cast, but also you stop what we call shocking blocking. And shocking blocking is where you've got one actor who is on stage and you've got another actor directly behind them who is talking. And you can't see their face. You probably can't hear them clearly because there's somebody stood in their way. Mm -hmm. 
And therefore, what is the point of them acting if they can't be seen by the audience? And so by having the buttons, you can tweak it and go, right, wait, look at the sight lines. Is that a bad position to have them deliver that line or can you move them round? And so that is the button. Interesting. Technique. So only quite recently, there's a, um, there's a group in the Playhouse here called Hip Hop Pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's only quite yeah. recently with their, their guests on the podcast. Yes. <laughs> everyone's, well, a, yeah. everyone's a guest on the yeah. podcast. Um, but I've recently been following their stuff on social media. Now, they've been showing their work on social media. Yeah. They've been showing their process of how they block a show. And whilst they, they do it on, on, a compu- on a PC, on a computer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's... But yeah, you they're blocking with buttons. They're blocking... In ah. exactly that same way, the dance routine. See, it must be good. And yeah, so and and you watch and you, when you see their performances, their their dancers, it's so thought. You can see the thought process as yeah. you're watching the entertainment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see that everyone is in the exact position, exact position of where they should be. And 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 I think that we need that more in theatre, don't we? We need that more. Again, I'm going to go back to amateur theatre. You see it a lot where you see the shocking blocking. Uh, you also see it a lot in youth theatre shows where you see an actor st- you, or you see one performer standing behind another performer yeah, while yeah, delivering yeah, the yeah. Line, And you're like, hello, guys. Can, <laughs> where yeah, are you? <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, I, I think there's a certain element of the director has to be aware of how many bodies they're putting on the stage and that can be and difficult when you've got you know, I've, I've taught at the, in sort of like theatre schools where you've got 30 kids mm-hmm. and everyone's got to have a little part trying to write scripts and sketches for our kids where you've got so many kids and yeah. like oh such and such hasn't had a line quick write a line in for them um, and yeah you you it's like herding cats because yeah. <laughs> like, well, you understand? No, 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 move, move. No, you got to step forward. Oh, and that—that that is what ends up happening. Is you end end up just going. All right, let's just deal with the fact that we've got so many kids. When you speak, step forward, then step back, then do that. Which is it, not a great way of teaching kids how to act because no. it's not. You're not really teaching them the right See, skills. What, what I'm getting here is, but I you're get, keeping the parents happy. Yes, there's that. <laughs> But what I'm getting here, and, and I get this a lot within these conversations, that I'm learning so much from these conversations. And I'm, this is a thing that in my last production where I had a big cast, I was very much at that point where I was herding cats, herding so many different people all around the place that I got to that point of very much like, yeah, you take a step forward on that line. Because it was getting so much of like, just people not like you, you give them their, like move here and then come out. And like, you worked all of that out. Yeah. But then it's not kind of gelling because they're humans and everyone's got different ideas. Yeah. Whereas I'm taking this now and going, next time I do a show like that, I'm going to use this, bu- the buttons. Yeah. I yes. am going to use yeah, yeah, this yeah. method. Yeah. Because then it, it's not just a verbal cue to them for what you want them to do there's the visual yeah so you can say i want you to move there 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 and there and stand blah 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 but this is what it looks like yes from my perspective from now yes and i don't think it's you know like us near, nearing 40 i've been doing this for nearly 20 years now it's not too late to introduce something never new. too late to learn no i need a week <laughs> are we pausing this pause just very quickly that's the beauty of uh, knowing the place as well as we do. Did you turn the mic off? No. I've got to listen to you. We have. I won't edit in this back. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. At least I went out on a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, cheers. Um, so, uh, hold on. Just take a second. We're back in. Yeah. Right, okay, so we're back in. We took a pause there. Now, yes. um, there was something that I put a mental, a mental pin in. Yeah, is that is that how we describe that when we think of something that we want to come yeah, back can to do. later? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, one thing I will say is, what on one of your podcasts you said about your clogs whirring in your head. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. No, the, the term is cogs whirring, but, like cogs of a clock. Yeah, no, no, yeah for you, but no, not no. for me. No, oh, yeah, it is actually wooden clogs it, yes, in your head. Like, okay, clogs, right, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, no. Uh, this is something that I'm realizing that maybe I'm meant to say the wrong words. Oh, okay. It's all deliberate. It's, it's all, all yeah, deliberate. It's all, yeah. 
that's one yeah. way to look at this. Yes, sorry. Yes. So anyway, the clogs are turning, and <laughs> and, and and you found a, a mental pin somewhere. <laughs> and I found a, a metal a, a metal pin a metal pin a metal pin. I found a metal pin in a thought. Now you said something about you being a daydreamer and how when you was at school. As with all of us, when we're at school, it's put down in our reports as a as a bad thing. As a yeah, yeah. It's put down. Could achieve so much more, more if he didn't daydream. If he didn't daydream. Now, yeah. what do you think this world would look like if we reframed that? If we looked at all these children that daydream, and we went, how can we nurture this? Well, uh, you know, it's um, it's interesting because we are on the cusp of a general election. And when you look at all of the rhetoric being used with regards to funding and things like that, nobody is talking about the arts. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Not one single person is talking about how important the arts is to the country and to society and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's all about, well, education, NHS, blah, 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 hit targets. And, this and these things are important. They are <laughs> important, but, but where would society be if it weren't for the dreamers? You wouldn't have the Beatles. You wouldn't have the great artists. You wouldn't have, you know, Turner's seascapes uh, in the National Gallery and things like that. There are, I feel that the nurturing of daydreaming and of creativity has kind of ended up sitting on the back burner. Mm -hmm. I always am taken, I'm taken back to a famous Churchill speech, which I'll, I'll, I'll probably mispronounce or say it slightly wrong. But during the war, Churchill was asked, why don't you cut funding to the arts? And he just simply replied, "Well, what are we fighting? What are we fighting for?" Yeah. And it and it and yeah. it, that is so true. Yeah. Like, what is the point of all of this without creativity? Without something to not just even if you're not someone that gives, but something that you receive. I think there is an element of. I don't know if one of your previous guests touched on this, but about if you allow people to dream and to be creative, they may dream, they will often dream about how they can make things better. Mm -hmm. And a lot of sort of the rule makers do not want that happening because they want you to stick within their rules. And daydreamers will think outside the rules. Mm -hmm. And I think there is an element of that. You know, again, through creativity, you get satire. You get things like that where you get people poking fun at the establishment, whether that is political or religious or, or whatever. It's very interesting that um, the, the Pope, I don't know what Pope he is, Pope Benedict the... 73rd or something like that yeah but he invited loads of stand-up comics and stuff like that to a session just recently and mm -hmm. said about how it's it's fine to use humor with religion mm -hmm. and it, i think he said something like because god has a sense of humor you know it's all he 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 was like it's all right and you've got all this talk about this like cancel culture about oh well, you can't make a joke about that you can't make a joke because you'll offend these people and you'll offend that person i've just read the autobiography uh well the first the first book because she's wrote two now of uh, miriam margulies and she is a proud jewish lesbian and as proud of all of the intricacies that her faith and sexuality brings and she's very critical about zion jewish structures the zion jews are israel and how she criticizes how they treat palestinians and things like that and so she's been branded an anti-semite even though she is jewish herself mm. and is a proud Jew at that. So 
again, so somebody creative who, you know, has experienced lots of different things in life and the stories that, she, you know, she's, the people that she's met and the things she's done, places she's been. And she's always been learning and she's a, very much a, a, an inquisitor. She's always asked, well, why are you doing that? And I think that is where society is is starting to lack in what it's doing. It's not asking enough questions anymore. People are just being fed stuff and they go, oh, right, okay. And that's how you end up with these polarised mm -hmm. sort of reactions to and certain I, things. And I think this is what we've done by quieting, quietening? Quietening, yeah. Quietening the dreamers. Yeah. By t saying, we need to work this out of this child. Yeah. We need we need we need to we need to fix this. There's nothing to fix. No. There's something to nurture. There there was a there was a recent there was it's, a, yeah, it's more of a case of all right, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. How do we turn this into a massive positive? Well, in the seventies, there NASA did a study NASA were struggling to find people to to bring in they 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 were finding people but they were they were finding only one what you would call a genius in every thousand applicants but nasa needs more than one genius yeah. they need a lot so they did this big study on where does where are the geniuses basically and so they went back to children and they discovered that within children 70% of children under the age of 7 are geniuses mm. and as they go through life that number gets slower and slower and slower until they get to the end of the education system that we still have in place yeah the only two percent so we go from 70 percent at age seven to 10 year, 10 11 years later two percent of genius the geniuses that's, is gone so that's depressing <laughs> because because of the... because we've said this person daydreams too much because we don't value the daydreaming. Yeah. This person is is too busy drawing. This person is too busy reading. This person is too busy being a critical thinker to study for their exams. Yeah. And the, so the teachers are passing that to the parents and then the parents are passing that to the kids. And then the kids are becoming what I would call drones. They're well, becoming yeah. part of a system. Whereas, what is the point of that? But also, and you know, this is uh, probably stating the obvious, but outside of school, yeah, at school, it's all become very technological. And it's like, right, okay, we're going to do this and everyone pull out your tablets and we're going to work on these tasks together. Kids go home and they're like, right, I'll make parents are making dinner. Um, that's if you're lucky enough to have a parent that knows how to cook. Mm -hmm. um, I'm busy doing this. You sit there and watch your look at your phone or look at your tablet or watch the telly. Mm -hmm. And there's no sort of go out and do things. Go out and you know with it be it, inquisitive. It's I just think, like I think there is force from, feeding. There is a lot of that. I think for me, I've been a parent that has tried to do that with my children. But the world surrounding them is very hard to escape. Mm. So it's very hard to, you know, we experience it ourselves as adults with social media. There's there's so much interaction happening on social media and it's yeah. constant feeding. Oh, it's very hypocritical of the, the fact that we're both on social media ourselves and, mm. you know, putting content out there. Yes. But, yeah. It's it's very diff the the world is it's more difficult now. I feel blessed to have been a child when at the age uh, and at the during the years that I was a child. So then, is this not a time that yeah that we should be looking at nurturing those creative types, those daydreamers, absolutely those those critical thinkers, well, those think people that are going to change the world. The, the the education system is already acknowledging that there are some people who are not just academics. They need a more practical, uh, visceral mm -hmm. uh, subject to learn about. So they're you know they're pushing the STEM the with the um, the mechanics and uh, the you know people who want to do engineering and uh, the other things because um, they've acknowledged that 
people are not great at learning languages or doing maths, but they're really absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. at building a brick wall. Mm. And which we all need. Which we all need. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yes. So maybe they they do need to. In an ideal world, you know, there is room for the daydreamers. And whilst there isn't at the minute, there is amateur theatre. And I think that is. You know, if you are a daydreamer, go find somewhere with other daydreamers mm. and find your go find, find your go tribe. find your yeah go find your tribe go find your people because they are out there yeah get out there into the world you know maybe that's a that I do think that's a place where social media is quite good is you can find very easy easily your people yeah because there are groups online which which have come together. But then, once you find them there, find a way to connect in this space. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so, we'll wrap this up now, because of time. Yeah. I think me and you could talk all day. Where's oh, that? we could easily. So, I think, I, I, think, I think you're going to be on the podcast again at some point. But I know for sure that you're going to be at the live show. Well, I might not be, but Bambarumba, I think, is going to turn up. There's going to be a return. Yes. Wow, that's gonna that's gonna get some bums on seats. <laughs> All my put people off turning up. Um, yes. Yes. But you should be returning for the live show, which is something that I'm currently pulling together. Yeah. At the moment, the 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 year anniversary. What to, what better point to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the first live show. Um, which so, is going to be a mix of entertainment and talks. Lovely. Yes. So this podcast will go out on the same day that the uh, that the live show is going to be happening, the thirtieth of July. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. Be a day full of gym. <laughs> oh my god! That's, that's, that's a nightmare for some people. But um, then the live show won't go out to the wider audience till a, till a few weeks later. Yeah. Um, but yeah cool that's where we'll see you next thank you very much so with that in mind final question have you got any hopes and dreams for the future at this point Jim? Um, well obviously I want skirmishes to be a huge success defined by the parameters that I said earlier um, and I'll just yeah I'll just continue to put a few more shows out uh, continue I just want to carry on doing what I'm doing, basically. I'm in a very happy place at the moment. And, um, yeah, may long it continue. Lovely. And final words, any advice for the young daydreamers out there, like you were, that young eight-year-old when you started theatre? Um, find other daydreamers. Because then when you're bouncing ideas off each other, that is when true magic can happen. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Jim. I appreciate you being here. No worries. And I appreciate you for joining us, as Thank always. You. And uh, Jim, thanks for listening. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be slightly weird. At the gym. Just at the gym. It's gonna, that's going to do something to your ego. Oh my god! Can you imagine that? Well, I said, to, I said, my head will get so big, I'll end up like top heavy. On I, the I, treadmill. I, I, I was watching one of, I was watching this back on on the TV the other day, one of the, one of the episodes, and my son walks into the room, Alex walks in, and he was like, "Dad, you finally found a way to feed your ego." <laughs> <laughs> After all these years, yeah. uh, that's not why I watched no. them back. I watched them back to start to study and to oh, work course, and to get better. Of course, of course, not yes, to just go. Oh, yes. there's me on the TV. <laughs> I finally did it. <laughs> it's when you start booking private cinema screens to like, oh, just oh yeah. Oh, sorry if I just. Oh. That could be the next thing. <laughs> I don't know, that might be a seed there. Could be, could be. Thanks again, Jim. No Thank you. Cheers, folks.